Welcome to No Clip, the podcast that's like a book club for people who don't think that books reward them enough for being good at them. I'm Chad Rodermans. And I'm Andy Kinnick. And today, we're going to be talking about Braid, a game that was developed by Number None and was published by Number None and Microsoft Game Studios, released in 2008 on Xbox 360, Windows, Mac, Linux, and PlayStation 3. Uh, but first, if you give us a like or a rating, it would be greatly appreciated. Also, also, uh, apparently there was an anniversary remaster announced for this game that was supposed to come out in 2021, but never came out. That's so, fascinating. If that ever comes out, also, it's on everything else. <laughs> <laughs> if you're listening to this in a world where Braid Remaster exists then amend appropriately yes uh but yeah we do not have the secret access to the braid remaster so we are instead playing braid the 2008 game braid classic braid classic as it's called um yeah and the thing that i wanted to mention uh before we started the podcast i looked at the paper and was like i didn't even know number none was the name of the development studio because this game is so T- like so heavily tied to Jonathan Blow's sort of uh, identity in the games industry mm-hmm. that he's the only person that I can associate with this game. And it doesn't help this game doesn't, as far as I can tell, have like a static credit sequence. I think there is one if you go into like the options or something. Mm-hmm. But like, I didn't see credits at all in this game. So uh, pff, whoever else worked on this, fuck him, I guess. <laughs> I do. I did read that there was an illustrator, and that apparently Jonathan Blow was very particular about uh, how it was to look, mm-hmm. and so there were many, many revisions, which does sound like a bit of a nightmare. Yeah, I mean that's just making art for anyone professionally. Sure, but um, yeah, he is like a weird auteur guy, uh, and a lot of people know who he is because of Indie Game the movie, right? Uh so yeah i also the same like when i looked it up i'm like oh okay it's he has a development studio and right. he, he is it isn't just him <laughs> or it might be but they just had the name for reasons yeah but, you know uh yeah and that is i mean i think a lot of the legacy of this game does it, it's it's weird like it is an auteur style game where it was mostly a one-man team who developed it uh and then it became a surprising success, and then because of the release of Indie Game the movie, which I think this is the first... There are weirdly two of them on our Mystery May list mm-hmm. uh, of the, I believe, three games that are talked about in that movie. Uh, this is the first time we're talking about a game that was featured in that film, which was a weirdly popular movie when it came out. And I don't really know why. <laughs> I just assume that like the culture was right at the time. Yeah. I think it was just right place, right time. Mm-hmm. Uh, like they just become like a, a thing uh, like with Xbox live arcade and et cetera, yeah. blah, blah, blah. And they, they were just right on top of it with putting it out. And so everyone has seen it for yeah. whatever reason. It was just like, yeah, it was a curiosity to people at the time. Like how like, three guys in a basement made a video game (laughs) and yeah and that's like uh this ended up being uh if i remember an article i read about it correctly i i believe braid ended up being the highest rated game on the xbox live arcade store Mm -hmm. uh which is an accomplishment of some kind a lot of people particularly in the reviewer space, really like this game. And I know a fair number of people who also really like this game, uh, but now we're going to talk about what we feel like with this game. Yeah, and just real quick, though, uh, before like we came in here, I was watching some old reviews, because uh-huh. this game is from 2008, and YouTube existed back then. So I got to like watch a couple of really old, like of the time <laughs> reviews and just got to feel like that time capsule of like how much things have changed. Uh, Cause yeah, like at the end of the one of them, the guy was like, yeah, I still think Castle Crashers is the best game on Xbox Live right now. Uh, but if <laughs> you want to get, pick up another one, definitely make it braid. And I was like, oh man. <laughs> 
<laughs> Imagine when you only had like two choices for, the, for indie game, <laughs> and you had to buy like an awkwardly priced uh, points card. Where six hundred points was ten dollars, but you had to buy like a thousand points at once, so that mm-hmm. you never had an empty balance. Very predatory stuff. <laughs> uh, but it had the cool blades interface, so you know. Shout outs to the Xbox Three Hundred and Sixty. Uh, <laughs> uh, yeah. So Braid is a puzzle platforming game, uh, and. It is uh, very heavy on the puzzles and very light on the platforming. I uh, remember many years ago, a uh, friend of the podcast, J.J. Artinez, mm-hmm. uh, telling me that Braid was his favorite platformer. And at the time, I had not played the game. Now, looking back, and I had played the game briefly before. This is the first time I've actually finished Braid. Uh, I am now recognizing that that was a joke he was telling, Mm. and I just didn't realize at the time. Because the joke of this game is that it is not a platformer, really very much at all. However, it does use the visual and mechanical language of a platformer, and I would argue this is, like, one of my favorite elements of the game, so... Uh... I feel like I disagree with that. Uh huh. Um, I do. I mean, I agree that it, the like the meat and potatoes of it, like it is a puzzle game. Uh, but like, I mean, all all the puzzles and everything in it really like involve platforming and jumping from platform to or platform to platform. Sure, but it's like to me, it's like saying Braid is your favorite platform. Well, yeah, that, I, I agree with that. That was like a joke from JJ. But it's like saying that Dark Souls is your favorite platformer. Platforming is required to finish the game, but it is not the focus of the game. And the game doesn't really test your platforming ability. That isn't the main goal of Braid. No. Or really a goal at all. I think it <laughs> it challenges you on a reflex-based thing about twice ever. Mm-hmm. Uh, and it's mostly just can you get from point A to point B as fast as you can. And also that is going to... Uh, 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 you're going to be able to rewind time and do that as many times as you want. So the challenge is really pretty minimal. Mm-hmm. Uh, so I, I don't know. It's it's interesting because it is a puzzle platformer by definition. I'm not going to say that it isn't. <laughs> yeah. But it's a puzzle game, and the platforming is just how you get around on the levels. <laughs> yeah. There, so just like a semantic thing, I guess? Sure. But I think it's important because the game uses so much of the visual language of platformers, specifically uh, the Super Mario Brothers, uh, with the existence of Goombas and Piranha Plants uh, and Pipes, which Mm -hmm. are just in this game more or less in like a comically weird way. (laughs) Yeah, and the princess is in another castle... With a dinosaur, etc. Yeah, uh, yeah. It's one. That's one of those details that like really stood out to me uh, when I first played the game because I think I played it initially in like 2015 and kind of bounced off of it. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, it's like I don't get it. <laughs> like it stands out like I think like such a sore thumb that it just has like Goombas, but with like a weird gargoyle lion face on it, <laughs> and it's got just piranha plants and. Because I is it, I I think it's supposed to like use that to like misdirect you into thinking it's gonna be a platformer and then it ends up not being so it's like a subversion right or like a, yeah like something like that but it it ends up feeling like really unnecessary to me and like just kind of weird yeah the intent so Blow has said and this is like. A paraphrase of a paraphrase, because I don't remember the exact quote, or even the quote as was (laughs) quoted where I read it. Uh, But basically that he developed Braid with the idea of trying to, like, satirize or, like, 
sub, uh, I don't know. <laughs> Dissect? Dur- turn on its head mm. what he thought the current trends in video games were. Uh, and if you look at it, like, it, at the time, in 2008, the, what, what I think of as the trends in video games are, like, Modern warfare, like gun games, mm-hmm. uh, but ev- military th- shooter. Yeah, but there's none of that in this game. So like, there's no way that that is like the bulk of what he's talking about there. So he must be either referencing platformers generally, or our perennial favorite uh, indie 2D uh, <laughs> platformer game. Uh, and that is what he made. But I, uh, the thing that it's that it directly calls to of Mario Brothers is, it, like you said, I think it is supposed to make you think about it as a platformer to then pull the rug out from under you. Mm-hmm. It makes it difficult sometimes to think about the solution to puzzles because you are seeing something that you would view as a regular challenge in a totally different game. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's interesting. Somebody who is who is who was more active in this at the time could probably give a better read on mm-hmm. what this game is <laughs> supposed to be uh, subverting. But to me, in this day and age, it feels like Braid is is being a platformer in order to trick you into playing the game wrong. Yeah, like, um, one interesting thing I was thinking about is, like, because I had to replay, or I didn't have to, but I ended up <laughs> replaying uh, most of the game, actually, uh, <laughs> to capture footage for this. Yeah. Because um, I didn't want to do it on my first playthrough, because the whole capture footage might just be me failing to solve one <laughs> level. Um, but, um, (laughs) so, like, I realized that, like, when you're playing it initially, uh, on the first couple of levels, like, it doesn't tutorialize the rewind until you die. Right. Which I think, like, can, like, yeah, prolong that feeling of, like, you jump on the Goombas and you get the puzzle pieces, (laughs) uh, until you end up, like, falling in a pit or whatever, and you rewind. So it's almost like a surprise mm-hmm. that you can rewind, which is interesting. Um, and I, I watched a, I watched as many videos as I could about this game because it's kind of vague yeah. um, and open about certain details of it. And I listened to him, like, uh, Jonathan Blow explained that, like, the idea for, the like, basing the game around time came from, like, some of his friends discussing Prince of Persia. Of course. And how, like, the rewind mechanic, like, takes away, like, consequence uh, from games. And uh, so he, he liked thinking about that idea and, like, doing a game about time where you can just rewind your mistakes and still making it feel like there's meaningful challenges to overcome and, like, meaningful consequences. And, like, he was really interested in, like, having it be an unlimited thing that you could do and uh not be a resource and etc cetera, etc cetera. like all these things you wanted to do so i guess that's kind of a little bit more uh about like what he was trying to do with it yeah i still don't think it really relates to mario that much <laughs> 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 and uh i still think that was a weird creative decision <laughs> yeah it's very strange i mean i think it is the one of those things where it's put in there to to, so that your mind goes to a familiar place, but yeah, yeah, I just it, it seems, it seems like, different from his intention. Yeah, especially like the game's art is so nice. Yeah, like it's got like the like impressionistic, like dreamy, painterly backgrounds. It just it feels like it doesn't need to do like the on the nose Mario thing mm-hmm. to accomplish that goal at all. So, like, maybe it was something, like, like we've brought up, it came out in 2008, uh-huh. that just unfortunately aged really quickly, because, like, that become, like, a really big indie game thing, to just, like, reference older games and stuff like that. True. Braid does predate Flappy Bird. Yes. <laughs> uh, another game that we have done an episode on, so, you know, go check that one out. Uh, <laughs> yeah, no, I mean, that's, I don't know, That that was, like, the thing that, that struck me the most about it is like when I, I play the game, at least like from face value, right? Like you play the game, you see the stuff that is, is obvious and intentionally. So, uh, 
intimately related to Mario, and then the, you play the game and it is entirely different. Um, so the actual challenge of the game comes in the form of these puzzles. And it's really interesting because it, the game itself, to complete, to get to the end of all the levels, like from point A to the like exit door, is almost never, not just not a challenge, but often doesn't even have obstacles in the way. You just sort of proceed from one to the other. And so the actual challenge of the game comes from collecting these puzzle pieces. So at the beginning, you're going to think, once again, because of all the platforming language that's in the game, that the puzzle pieces are like extra challenges. They're dinosaur coins. They're strawberries. They're some other shit that you don't need to do, but they're there for people who want the challenge. But it becomes... Not even all that quickly, but at some point apparent that you do have to get all of them. And a lot of them feel impossible when you first look at them. <laughs> uh, did, you have a, did you have a super easy time with the game? Oh, no, not at all. Okay. Um, <laughs> as I said, I, I picked this up in 2015 initially, I think on JJ's recommendation, because mm-hmm. uh, he likes this game a lot, or at least did at the time. Um, and I bounced off of it super hard. Uh, yeah. like I, especially back then, I think I played games much more casually and this kind of blindsided me with how hard it was. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, like I ran through most of the levels. I think it's even like, as you were saying, like intentionally designed how it is for you to do that because like earlier on, there's more actual like platforming to get through, to get to the exit door. And uh, most of the later levels, like, uh, the whole level is, like, on platforms, and you could just walk easily underneath all of it from one door to the other right. without anything in your way. So, um, yeah, it's so I ended up doing that a lot, like, just running through the levels, not getting the puzzle pieces. I think when I booted the game up, I had gotten to World 5, and had completed none of the levels, you know, <laughs> like I had like a handful of puzzle pieces in each world. Uh, so it was, yeah, like, I think that's going to be a pretty common thing for a lot of people to do to like get past the first couple worlds before they realize like, oh, I'm going to have to go back and get all the stuff. Right. Yeah. And, and the achievement system, at least on Steam, which I assume are imported directly from the Xbox Live version of the game, mm-hmm. uh, is like in itself, it's structured in a way that you get an achievement for completing the level mm-hmm. and then you get another achievement for solving the level. Right. Uh, so it even separates it out like that. Honestly, the fact that there are levels that you can run through without any challenge, I think, is the first signal that you get that you're going to have to collect them. Because as you solve things, what it does is in the house overworld hub thing, mm-hmm. it adds more rungs to the ladder that go up to the uh, exit. And that's not really apparent that it's happening. It just sort of does happen. Uh, Or at least I don't think it is. I don't know. Maybe if you solve the puzzle on the house screen, it makes more of an animation. But I rarely did. I think it all takes place off screen. Yeah. As far as I can tell. So you just don't get anything for that. So it's not easy. Yeah. If you don't check it, you you won't notice for a while. Right. Though I guess the very first hint is probably that you start on World Two, mm-hmm. uh, which is uh, I would say it was it's a glaring thing, but I don't know if it's very clear about what it's signaling. Yeah, I think it's just supposed to set up a mystery. Is like what it wants to do. Like I right. I I put two and two together pretty quick. Like I was like. We start on World 2, we can't access the attic, like the attic is where a level, or World 1 is. Yeah. uh, Which is correct. So I I think it wants to get you curious about getting to that location, uh, and to make make you think about how to get there. Yeah. And it, like, works with the whole overall theming, not to jump too far ahead, but the fact that World 1 is the last level, you're like, kind of going backwards mm-hmm. uh, it's like a cyclical thing time yeah. etc 
And at the end of World 1, you get spit back out and go to World 2 to start the game over again. So, yeah, it it makes sense. Uh, and I'm not criticizing the thematic elements of doing it. But as far as, like, to a new player, starting on World 2, you'll notice that. And then later you'll realize that you do have to collect everything in order to finish <laughs> yeah. the game. Uh, and there's some level of understanding in between that. Uh, but yeah, so, uh, collecting puzzle pieces, <laughs> not easy to do. Yeah, like, I think, we've talked about this in a couple of other episodes, like, I think maybe The Last Guardian comes to mind. It's like, I think Braid is a kind of puzzle game that, like, uses a specific kind of puzzle design, uh, which in my head I'm thinking of, it's just like, it makes like real puzzles <laughs> <laughs> that you actually have to problem solve to beat. Mm -hmm. Um, and they can make you feel really dumb. Uh, cause like, <laughs> like the, the thing, the thing that makes them feel so hard to me anyway, uh, is that it's kind of hard to like internalize how all of the mechanics like work together or how they like affect each other or like how things react to like what you're gonna do like there's certain things like uh like there's like the green items that aren't affected by the rewind and sometimes it's hard to tell how like a green key is gonna react with a green door or right. you know and there's like a lot of little trial and error things like that like figuring out just how the mechanics are gonna react uh before you can even like try and start to, like, to solve the puzzle. You had to, like, understand the tools better by, like, experimenting. Yeah, in the grand scheme of video game puzzles, they're, like, I would separate them into, like, three different styles of puzzle. The one that I've talked about on the podcast the most is what I call newspaper puzzles, which is where they just are, like, a maze or put the red thing on the red thing, uh, a sort of a non puzzle. Yeah. Like push the button. Yeah. You know, sort of thing. Well, that's more, I guess I shouldn't have said the red one. That one is more in the second category, okay. but just like something that could have been done in any medium transposed into video games for the sake of having a puzzle there. And I'm kind of derisive of these. I think they're kind of stupid. Braid is definitely not that. And the second one is like the adventure game Zelda style puzzle where it's more about the exploration and you like figure stuff out and it's dynamic. And then Braid has the puzzle type where you have to sit there and figure out every individual moving part and then execute on it. Mm -hmm. And it's done in various different ways throughout Braid, my favorite of which being the ones where you figure out what the important elements are and then plan out a way to do a thing and complete it. Uh, and my least favorite being figure out what you have to do and then you have to execute it perfectly because that version of it sucks for me. I don't like doing that mm -hmm. uh, because I feel like I work so hard <laughs> to get the actual puzzle all in my head at one time. And then I have to execute, and that's where I always end up fucking up. Mm -hmm. uh, so yeah, Br Brain has definitely the most cognitively straining puzzles, I think, of of the types of video game puzzles that I've seen. Yeah, I was like, like I said, it's like you have to do actual problem solving, mm -hmm. whereas just like your category, like of type two puzzles, right? Like a Zelda puzzle is more of like a they can still be hard, but there's still more, like, guided, like, kind of specifically designed experiences. Yeah. Where, yeah, like, um, I Jonathan Blow is, like, he was, like, I think a software engineer before he became a d game developer. Right. And I, I think of the puzzles kind of like, like, I like listening to people talk about programming from, like, a software design standpoint is where you have, like, a problem you need to solve and you have, like, tools to solve it, and, like, often you can beat your head against something for a long time, and then it ends up being, like, this really simple solution uh, right. that ends up being the, 
you know, like the 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 epiphany moment when you're like, oh, it's this simple. That's all I needed to do, and I'm trying to do fucking all of this shit over here. <laughs> uh, it's one of those things where it's like you have several tools to work with, and you're trying to solve it with a particular tool, but the actual easier way to do it is by using a different tool entirely. Yeah, or using it in a different way that you hadn't thought of, or it could mm-hmm. be any number of things. Um but yeah, they it, it come off more like that, you know, like uh, having to really solve a problem. Um, yeah, and you could use computer programming. I know the game itself has like allusions to uh, the creation of the atom bomb, right? Or like you could even like say like putting someone on the moon, or like having some kind of an impossible task that you have to like solve problems to progress to that goal, and like kind of having to like. Advance, actually having to like advance your knowledge mm. and like maybe like invent new things to be able to accomplish that goal it almost kind of feels like it's like a metaphor for like problem solving in that way is at least like a, an interpretation i had of it based on like what i know of the creator of the game yeah <laughs> which is yeah it's one of the, it's it's a thing that you wouldn't even be able to form an interpretation of until you've actually finished the game yeah right like uh the games i don't really want to talk about the game's narrative and presentation right yeah now. not yet yeah because we gotta take this game all the way downtown <laughs> uh so- <laughs> but yeah i agree it's it's got a very strong focus on its uh on that problem solvability whereas like then you do a jigsaw puzzle, which is a newspaper type puzzle. Yeah. Uh, but either way, it's like a. Uh, it, it is just like every level does feel like an actual challenge, and not just every level, but every individual puzzle piece. Uh, I think it's more for people who are um, smart <laughs> uh, and who will sit and look at the screen. And work it out and figure it out. And I get fidgety and go, mm. I just want to, like, try things. <laughs> yeah. And that doesn't work. It's it's kind of like how I bounced off Catherine. Yeah. I, I the, my problem with it is, like, I second guess myself. Mm. Like, you say, like, you work it all out in your head. And y- then you try and execute it. And then you can't do it because it's one of the ones that, like, you have to do it just right. So you start to think like, oh, maybe this isn't the solution. Right. And then you can like go and waste a bunch of time trying to do something else. Um, so like for me, like that's where I bounce off games like this is like, I'm not, I'm not confident enough <laughs> that like I found the right solution, even if I have, if it's like hard to execute it. Yeah. There's one, <laughs> there's one puzzle that I second guess myself so deeply that i just straight up left and had to come back like after i had beaten everything else uh that was just like you had to raise a platform and then raise a second platform Mm. using the clone and i ended up like just not working it out evidently you can the clone itself can Mm -hmm. activate a lever yep even if it isn't standing next to it like you can just mash the up button and he will or whatever button it is on any other you know platform uh and he will flip the switch when he gets to it and i just didn't know that and so when i was doing that puzzle like i had i was trying to figure out a way to like make it all the way down and rewind back up so i was doing like two cycles and then rewinding both of them Mm. to see if I could get onto the platform when he raised it up and it just was too complicated. And so I gave up on it and then later found out that was the solution. So yeah. And I mean, that's a really good example because like once you know how to do that one, it seems so simple. Yeah. But like when you first approach it, yeah, you're like, okay, I have to rewind it because it requires you to rewind twice. Mm -hmm. And so you have to keep it straight in your brain. Like, okay, I'm here. I'm going to go there. So that when I rewind, I'm going to go here and the ghost is going to go here. Right. And like you have to like keep track of like four different things. And it's easy to just like in the moment, like forget what's going to happen. 
Uh, like there's one earlier on that's a, a bit simpler where there's like a platform over a pit and you have to like go up and stand. It's like a bubble puzzle piece. Like you can't jump the pit ladder platform. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So you have to go like stand above where the puzzle piece is, then come down and flip the switch and have it go across and then rewind. So you know, it's not there because it's a green platform, so it won't move. <laughs> but like, you have to realize that rewinding it will let you go through the platform, yep. etc. You know, like and that took me a while to figure out, and then once I did, I was like, oh, duh, right? <laughs> you know, like so many of the puzzles are like that, or at least they were for me, where they seemed like really hard, and then some of them I even felt like I fumbled my way through, and then <laughs> solved them, and was like, I don't really understand what happened. Mm-hmm. Um, like if somebody asked me to explain this one, mm-hmm. I would not be able to do it. Yeah. Uh, there are only a couple like that. Um, but yeah, like, I don't, yeah, like it's really hard, especially early on. Like it ended up for me feeling like the middle of the game was the easiest part. Okay. Cause like the beginning, I, it was hard for me to wrap my head around a lot of stuff. And then at the end it gets more complicated. Like the middle kind of ended up being the sweet spot for me. Um, so yeah, it was weird like that. <laughs> Yeah, there are two uh, different uh, mechanics. There are different mechanics in each stage, essentially. The first stage, which is World 2, d- doesn't. It's just the rewind mechanic. But mm-hmm. then you have other ones uh, as you go through. And for me, uh, and it's like I feel like how you interact with these puzzles is only a baseline understanding as to whether or not you're going to enjoy your time with this game. Yeah. Because I ended up really... I found that to be the opposite. The first part of the game, except Mm. for that. I agree with the first part of the game being difficult to get your head around. But once you do, you kind of coast through it. Uh, And then World 3 was fine for me, but then World 4 introduces the move forward to move time forward and move back to reverse it Mm -hmm. and that and then my perennial least favorite puzzle mechanic in history the you make a clone of yourself that does the thing that you just did Mm -hmm. uh (laughs) i really hate that and i was really bad at Mm -hmm. the the move the movement based ones uh and so i ended up struggling extremely hard in four and five Mm. Uh, more so than any other point in the game and by a huge margin (laughs) Uh, for me it was yeah world two probably felt the hardest or i mean world three Mm -hmm. the second world you do um because like i think like it took me a while to like because like the game doesn't tutorialize stuff as we say right i found like the green particle effect kind of hard to notice Sure, so, like, there yeah. would be, like, a key that was green, and I was trying to do stuff with it for a while, and I didn't even notice it was a green key. And I'm like, oh. So, I, I found that kind of easy to overlook. Um, and, yeah, like, it's just early in the game, so it's, like, hard to work it out. Like, I feel like once I conquered World 3, <laughs> like, when I got, like, World 4 and 5's mechanic is more complicated, but, like, I felt like I had that baseline understanding of how braid worked when I got to those levels yeah. or worlds. So they didn't seem as bad. Like I went through them, got most of the puzzle pieces and had to go back and sweep up, you know, the last like four or so. Uh, so, which was much smoother than world two had been for three had been for me. Yeah. I, I will say my potentially my favorite braid moment was in uh world three which was where i picked up no it was world four Uh, the running forward and back mechanic Mm -hmm. it did involve a green key yeah uh but the running forward and back mechanic was the one that i was most upset that i didn't get because Mm -hmm. it had several moments that i thought i really liked uh particularly the running on moving platforms to fast forward time right or backwards to slow it way down um I thought was very cool, but my favorite braid moment of the game. Uh, <laughs> so put it on the the, the instant replay. Uh-huh. Uh huh. Is the when I got a key and then just ran face forward into a door going left, mm-hmm. and because time was rewinding, it just didn't open, and I was <laughs> like, okay, I deserved that. Like I <laughs> didn't think ahead. I ran straight into a wall and I have to start the level over because the key is green and it broke. Uh, And I found that to be like very funny and also 
uh, really drove home, like, these are the intersecting mechanics, and you smashing your face against this door is a perfect example of why you haven't grasped it yet. Mm -hmm. So it had moments of things like that that I did really like, uh, and I just didn't like the parts that were tedious. Yeah. Uh, Unfortunately, at least for me, like the moments that are tedious are most of the game. Uh (laughs) But like it does, it does have that like real like sense of satisfaction though. Um, And I, I, it's one of those games that like, I feel like, is bad for our podcast format. Like yeah. having to beat this in like a week and a half is not the best way to enjoy it. I don't think. Yeah. I think it really depends on, I guess what kind of person you are. Yeah. yeah. I, I had to look a handful of things up Same. to make sure I finished it in time. And I mean, I may have had to, even if I didn't have a deadline, but yeah, I mean, there are a few things that I just wouldn't have been willing to put the time into. Oh yeah, for sure. Uh, because this isn't my style of game. Jonathan Blow, famous for Braid, also famous for The Witness, a game that I will never in a million years <laughs> play. Looks very cool. Uh, I know that I will hate it. So <laughs> there you go. I guess if we get it requested or something, yeah, uh, then maybe, but still probably not Mm -hmm. uh i also don't like playing this kind of a game especially not in long sittings and this probably took me longer than most people to finish i think it took me like eight ish hours uh Mm. to get through that doesn't seem long to me it doesn't seem exceedingly long it's long according to how long to beat dot com everyone lies on (laughs) how long to beat dot com i don't know that's pretty accurate uh, see for me it's consistently i think people shave like two hours off of what their actual time was based on my experience i need to go on there and become a an honest time (laughs) giver as a whatever yeah i mean maybe i'm reading into things but Mm -hmm. i feel like it's pretty consistent that like if i took like 17 hours on a game like the average time will be like 14 and a half (laughs) it's like i think people are slightly lying about how fast they beat the game right they're like well it couldn't have been that long I probably left the game on while I was doing something else. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but yeah, I don't know. It's just that is the the nature of puzzles, I think. Yeah. As described by us. Yeah. And I think they're like really cleverly um like the game as I said has like a really sparse narrative or one that's kind of like left up to interpretation, but like I think like the gameplay mechanics are like interestingly tied in um if you kind of like pay attention to the themes like the names of the worlds and like what the little stories are about Mm -hmm. like the first set of books talks about like erasing your mistakes and the mechanic is the rewind thing yeah and then the second set of levels it talks about like oh well if you erase all your mistakes you erase all your opportunities for growth and then it introduces the green items that can't be rewound and therefore introduce consequences. Right. And, you know, it, it does stuff like that, which I think is like really clever uh, and interesting. You know, it would be clever and interesting if, uh-huh. if we talked about that theming and stuff after, after the break. break. Uh, that would be a good idea. Yeah. That would be interesting and clever. Yes. What I said. <laughs> podcast just like mama used to make uh we're definitely coming back in on that by the way (laughs) uh welcome back to the podcast that's just like your mama used to make (laughs) on braid because this game is old like your mama uh right themes story plot I don't know why I closed the notebook. <laughs> That's a good question. <laughs> uh, now it's back open to the notes. Now now you know everything. Now I am knower of the tomes. <laughs> uh, so, here, here's my confession. Mm-hmm. The writing in this game is very eloquent. It sounds very good. It's poetic in a lot of ways. Mm-hmm. Uh, 
I didn't get it. If you, <laughs> <laughs> if if you had pulled me out of the room ten minutes after I finished Braid and asked what I thought like the cool themes and stuff of the game were. I would have probably taken a few random stabs in the dark mm-hmm. and uh, not gotten a good... You wouldn't have gotten a good answer out of me. Yeah, I think that's fair. I, I benefited a lot from essentially just replaying the game. Yeah. Uh, to capture the footage, uh, youtube.com slash noclip podcast. Um, so yeah, a lot of it stood out more to me on a second time. Um, especially, yeah, like, those connections between, like, the books and then the mechanics, like, uh, like, the ring, like, freezing time, it's, like, his, like, wedding ring, and he, like, feels like he can't move past that relationship, so the ring, like, represents that. Right. Cool little things like that, um, that, like, I didn't really notice the first time either. (laughs) Yeah, it's, like... The the fact that the books are all at the beginning of the levels, mm-hmm. it's hard. It's easy to forget everything that they said. Yeah, over the course of the entire game, like because it is presented in such a static way. Here's the narrative part. Here's the mechanical exploration, and because the game is so mentally taxing from a mechanical standpoint, even though the themes of each level are reflected in the in the uh, in the titles of the worlds and the mechanics you're using them in, it's very easy to get lost in the sauce, as mm-hmm. the kids say. Uh, and you end up sort of, like, not really thinking about it. Yeah, it's <laughs> On... a, It is a lot of flowery language and a couple of key lines yeah. that are the things that are relevant. So, yeah, it's easy to not pick up on any of it. <laughs> and, like, even at the very end of the game... There's actually just hidden narrative content that I didn't know about. Mm-hmm. Like uh, with the stars? Not the stars. Uh, I don't even know what the deal is with those. But yeah. I know there's one of them that apparently you have to wait like two hours on a cloud. Yep. Uh, which I support. I think that's a funny <laughs> thing that I, I enjoy. Um, the game is about time after all. It's true. And it's going to... It doesn't demand much of you <laughs> just to finish it. But if you want to go the extra mile... Uh, but, but uh, no, there's uh, in the epilogue section. Mm, there's the empty books. Yeah, that I didn't know were a thing until I think maybe the last one. I I wrote I figured out the platform puzzle to rise up mm-hmm. on the platform, but then didn't know what to do once I was there. And then later realized that to proceed, I didn't actually even need to do that puzzle. I could have just walked to the right. But it just screamed, this is a puzzle, so yeah. I did it. And then I jumped off, and there, like, if you land behind a thing, it gives you additional stuff. Mm-hmm. Uh, something about him wanting to be in a candy store as a <laughs> child. Yeah, And I was like... I don't know what this is and looked it up later and there's just more. There's more of that that I didn't know existed in that part of it. So mm-hmm. I felt like there were pretty big gaps in my knowledge of like what all the game was trying to to tell. Yeah. Uh so it was an interesting game to play because there was there was a lot of analysis going on both mechanically and narratively. And I felt like the game was structured in such a way that I had a difficult time with the narrative part of it. Uh, it, it was it, it, the themes felt like they came through well, but it was the overall message that I was missing. And I understand the game doesn't have a strict narrative; mm-hmm. it has gestures at a narrative, and that was what I was hoping to get more of. And just wasn't able. I feel like the game asks too much of its player to understand what it's trying to get across. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I, I mean, it seems kind of intentional to me. Like, you're supposed to, like, I think the game is relatively short. Mm-hmm. Uh, especially if you play it a second time, you'll breeze through it in like two and a half hours. Uh, or or shorter. Right. Um, and I feel like... It's it's stuff that, uh, yeah, it's like better examined on a second time through when you can focus on it more. 
Um, but yeah, I, I think some of the main stuff kind of comes through pretty clearly, like the stuff with the princess that like he's like leaving a relationship that he's in to pursue this other woman that he feels compelled to for some reason. Right. Um, and I think that's intentional. Like once again, the Mario thing, like it, it, it wants to present like, Oh, go get the princess is kind <laughs> of like its story. And then there's a lot more to it. Right. Um, yeah. Like I, I think it, it wants the player to like work for everything. Uh, and yeah, some people are going to like that more than others, I guess. Yeah, and I'm not I'm not levying this necessarily as a criticism of the game story, just that it was a it's a kind of story that makes it, as you said before, kind of bad for our format. Uh because it's not a game that I got to sit with and really digest. Mm-hmm. And I feel like if I did, I would have a lot more to praise about its storytelling. Um but the way that I've played it, I didn't get enough of it for me to really have much of an opinion. Mm-hmm. I, the intention definitely is to keep it vague and to make it the, like I have heard from multiple places uh, that the game has a its narrative may be centered around the idea of the creation of the atom bomb. Mm-hmm. Uh, and by multiple places, I mean one place, and then you said it, so that makes two. Yeah, I think that's just more of like a comparison and not actually what the game's about right. at all. But it's like one of the easy things to pick up on. Yeah, because from my understanding, there was one book that mentions it at all. Yeah, there's a quote in the epilogue that's from one of the people that worked on the Atom Bomb. It's like, now we're all sons of bitches now yeah. or something like that as well. Yeah. And there is a... To me, that takes me to... Uh, Twin Peaks, uh, because they, <laughs> yeah, uh, The Return, Episode 8. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's Twin Peaks Return, Episode 8, required viewing for anybody who wants to play Braid. Uh, <laughs> Jonathan Blow looked through time in space uh, <laughs> and saw Season 3 of Twin Peaks before making Braid. Which I will always be envious of him for. <laughs> but it is what, it took me there and it made me sort of analyze it in a similar way. Because they're doing kind of similar things with it. The idea of it being like this evil act of man. And Braid, that was something that I didn't consider when I was playing, but was introduced to that idea afterward. That made me go back and think like, Okay, in that context, like, what are we talking about? You have the level where you are in reverse chasing the princess. So Tim is set up to not be a good dude uh, pretty intentionally. And he has, like, very several, like, scenes within the game of him having a problematic... Uh, relationship with multiple different people. Mm-hmm. Um, he wants to control everything. Right. And th- also, as we mentioned briefly uh, on break, we were talking about how there's a, a, almost all of the puzzles it show him drinking wine. Oh, so there's yeah, an implication yeah. that he may or may not be an alcoholic as well. Uh, including, like, the fr- I think the first one is the starkest example because it's like him in a having a bit of a tryst. A no, meetup. yeah, it's like a romantic picnic. Yeah, and him like have a roll in the hay, back, <laughs> having a roll in the hay, and reaching back for the 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 goblet, the glass of wine. Yeah, uh, in, indicating that it's important to him, uh, and to see it in multiple things. So that's another thing that you have to take into account. Like, okay, so Tim might be an alcoholic, and then at the end you have like, oh, Tim might have had. Uh, sort of a confrontational relationship with his mother. He may not understand why the people who love him love him uh, or why they aren't doing more for him because of his controlling nature. So there's all these different themes that kind of get mixed up together. And I kind of came out of it with the message like, okay, Tim's a (laughs) douchebag. I get that. Uh, does he... Yeah, he was given the, the power right. of the time manipulation, yeah. Yeah, and that's even if he does, or if that's all metaphorical yeah, as well, right? right? Like, there's a lot to it, and it's a lot of stuff to try and take in, and I feel like in this situation where I've just beaten the game once, I'm you not... can't digest it. Yeah, I'm, I'm yeah. not coming at this with the what I would like to. Yeah, like, this is a lesson... At least where I, I took it as a lesson anyway, early on when we did the episode on Transistor, mm. 
Uh, I took no lessons from that. <laughs> yeah, well, it just it's it was just like a formative experience for me in terms of like doing the cast because like JJ really likes that game and he was like before we played he was like oh you know try and pay attention to it and like the narrative <laughs> is like really intricate and you know there's a lot of subtleties and stuff and things to pick up on etc cetera, etc cetera. and. Uh, we both finished it like the day we recorded the episode and had no time to think about it. Yep. And so it's like JJ being like, oh, this and that. And then we're just like, uh. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, that's why I like try to speed up the digestion process. And it's why I always like read reviews and like see what other people think. It helps me like cement my own opinions and stuff on games. Yeah. But anyway, that's a little behind the curtain talk. Look out for the transistor epilogue coming twenty twenty four or whatever. Yeah, uh, but yeah, no, yeah, it, it is. This is one of those kind of games where, it, like, it does require reflection. Mm-hmm. It's one of the reasons why I think my favorite puzzle mechanic of the game is the ring. Not just because I just really like the way that it it functions. It's and like plays. a black hole. It's like a little black hole that slows time down. Mm -hmm. And like the closer you get to the center. Yeah. The area of effect is great because it doesn't actually it has like a ring that shows the literal area. But it still affects outside that ring a little bit. Yeah, by a little bit, but the it's just diminished. And uh Mm -hmm. outside of the event horizon. (laughs) Exactly. Braid is a lot like the classic nineteen ninety four science fiction (laughs) film Event Horizon. Classic. A classic. Starring that guy from Jurassic Park. Yeah, I should remember his name. Sam Neill. Yeah, that's it. I don't know how I remember <laughs> it, but it came to me. Uh, but yeah, because it, it's one where I, you know, I was already in that mode, right? Where I'm trying to figure out the game more. Mm-hmm. Uh, and it's a visual thing. Like, it's the ring is, a, is an actual thing. They make direct reference to it. You can also you, you use it for platforming. Yeah, you can use it to make higher jumps and stuff. So it, it does kind of interact with the mechanics in a bit of a different way mm-hmm. than everything else. Yeah, if there's any downside to this idea of sort of structuring your game in the way of a platformer, but doing it as a puzzle game, it's that sometimes it's just hard to tell. Uh, it's hard to make a mechanic that interacts well with the platforming mechanics as well as it does with the puzzle mechanics, uh, which is what g- the green sparkles and the move back and forth to change time kind of do. Whereas the the ring feels like it fits both genres well. Yeah, it's like an item. Yeah. And the other things are like modifications to like what you do, yeah. like abilities. In a more traditional platformer, they would be gimmicks of individual levels. Yeah. Uh, whereas the ring would be a thing that might get mapped to a button where you actually get to slow time down and stuff. So, mm-hmm. yeah, all of that's very interesting and good. Um, but I think the ring is the best of them as far as like the actual mechanical implementation goes but also thematic i think i think that it does tie well into the rest of what the game is trying to do Mm -hmm. and it reminds you to be thinking about it in that way so yeah yeah, and it 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 definitely leads to some of the like harder puzzles i think right at the very end uh like there's one that's like a reprisal of an earlier level where you have to like move the little goomba guys and you have to like adjust the timing of the piranha plants so they can march through, so you can jump on them. And you need to get two of them over there so you can bounce <laughs> high enough. Yeah, that took me fucking forever to do. <laughs> like you have your puzzle mantra. Like a sign of a bad puzzle is like you know what to do, but then it's really hard to do it. Yeah, this was that yeah. for me. Like the <laughs> example of that in this game for me, where it's like. I probably tried it like 35 times before I got it. <laughs> yeah, and actually doing the the fact that this game has a double jump mechanic where like if you bounce three on three times even you can go That's even true. Higher, yeah. It's a triple jump. Oh shit, somebody called Mario 64. Uh wahoo. Wahoo. I wish Tim would say that. <laughs> it, just one time, you yeah. know. Wahoo. <laughs> Uh, that even feels like a, a stretch because a lot of the times, like the double jump feels so, it doesn't, it's not a thing that you 
consider as part of the puzzle because mm. it's not a thing that you do very often. Yeah. You can really only do it in the uh, the levels where you can go back and forth to move time because right. you're able to jump on them backwards and not kill them. Yeah. Or at least that's where it's the easiest to do it. Yeah, it's, it's, it is uncommonly used elsewhere. And you can use your shadow guy to, like, get killed and knock one in, saw an enemy in the air and then jump off of it, which is also kind of another form of a double jump. Yeah, which I think is another mechanic that gets used exactly one time, where you have to jump at least into... Twice. Okay, I only remember doing it one time, where you jump into an enemy and mm-hmm. springboard it and then rewind and then jump on him. Uh... Yeah, I think if you actually had to break it down, I'm talking about mechanics a little bit more here. That's my bad. No, it's fine. Uh, <laughs> uh, if if you had to break it down, the puzzles, I have such a love hate relationship with the puzzles that use a different mechanic, or rather, use a mechanic in a different way than is ever used before. Like, I really like the idea of the puzzle where you have to jump to your death, but then rewind and have it passed to mm. you, uh, but. It didn't. That didn't. That solution did not come to me very quickly, uh, because it's not a thing that had ever been. I didn't know if the key would get passed to me or not. Yeah. Uh, so there was a lot sort of going on in a lot of those, and that's another one where you just have to like just jump into his ass, and he'll fly up in the air, <laughs> and then you rewind, and then you can jump off of him while he's in the air. Uh, it's like stuff like that is very, very hard to figure out, but yeah, is but, not. but very cool. Yeah, it's a really good idea that's just uh, taxing to the player. Yeah, there's like there's one later on that's easier to figure out, but kind of similar, like not a thing you would think that you could do, where you just had to like jump off of a platform and then rewind right before you hit the door, and then oh, your yeah, shadow he... goes and he hits the door and unlocks it. And yeah, yeah, that is that's another one, like. Super cool when you figure it out, but like, man. But like, why would you think to do it? Yeah. yeah. It to me, it's like people complain about that Metroid Fusion room mm. where you have to bomb a random floor tile. Yeah. To me, that's what that reads like. Is like, th- here's this thing. Except that, you don't have a super bomb in this case. Yeah, you just have to figure that out somehow, mm-hmm. and it does feel like kind of unfair to me yeah it feels like crusty crab fun fair yeah mr Krabs is in there <laughs> standing at the concession you can't say it and then not finish it i mean i was going to but plotting his oppression <laughs> um you know what i actually really liked about the my favorite thing about the move forward and backward in both space and time Mm -hmm. level is the fact that the music does the music goes backwards yeah and the music is always in it has like its tempo but then anytime that time is moving faster or slower or in reverse the music goes with it um I thought that was very good. As far as, like, soundtracks go, Braid is an entirely classical soundtrack. Mm -hmm. Uh, It's it's good music. Yeah, it it goes along with kind of that painterly aesthetic. Like, Mm -hmm. it it, it all feels very dreamlike. Yeah, like, you have, like, the... uh, the little cloud transitions between the house and the levels. Uh, So, yeah, I I think, yeah, it does its job. It, like, it, it, it... puts it it gives it this atmosphere of something out of a painting yeah but then i think the addition of the fact that it does follow in time with what you're doing is i think is what puts it over yeah like that's what makes me actually like it Yeah. yeah it does fit the theme but the addition of the the little effects i i will say that the sound design by you know, at large, was not my favorite part of the game. Mm-hmm. I thought that most of the sound effects were... I mean, they're probably, I have to imagine, just sourced from a... A, a library. A library, yeah. Because they aren't, like... There's no voice acting. There isn't anything, like, mm-hmm. really... Well, there's a, a little bit of voice acting. There's some wailing yeah, that yeah. occurs on occasion. But uh, 
But yeah, a lot of them felt felt like very different from the rest of the game, and like the sound effects were working in contrast with the rest of what was going on. Mm-hmm. Didn't yeah. didn't love it. Yeah, I don't don't disagree. I think it's just a product of its indie game two thousand eight ness. Oh yeah, absolutely. Yeah, like I think like the death sound effect feels very much like it's just pulled out of a a library and just slapped in there. Yeah, so you have the death sound, the sproing when you yeah. jump on things, that terrible lever noise that makes like, me yeah, want like, to hurt myself. Like canned, canned sound effects, I think yeah. is the name for it. Yeah. And in fact, the lever one kind of sounds like ripping the top off an aluminum can. <laughs> so maybe that's where that... Just metal scraping on metal sound yeah. effects. <laughs> It's very grating. Mm -hmm. Uh, But yeah, obviously not the thing uh, that this game's known for. is It's great sound. (laughs) Uh, Do you have a favorite puzzle or a least favorite puzzle? Yes. (laughs) Okay, moving on. Uh, (laughs) Which one was it? I'm going to revise my answer now. (laughs) I don't have one prepared, that's for sure. Yeah. I would say my favorite puzzle was one of the ones with the ring. And my least favorite puzzle was a tie for all of them <laughs> with uh, the ghost mechanic. Mm-hmm. Because I just don't like that mechanic. The end. <laughs> I would say my least favorite puzzle is the one where you had to raise the platform with the ghost mm. because it took me forever and then I never figured it out and I tucked my tail between my legs <laughs> and I googled it because I had no fucking idea what I was how to do that. Yeah, I think my least favorite one is the only one that gave me trouble twice because it tripped me up when I replayed it as well. Um, I think it's called something like a... F- like a fickle companion mm. or something like that. No, the key. You had to get the key, um, and you have to get like the enemies to grab onto it and carry it for you. Like, yeah, man, is that one feel like there's so much going on? Yeah, in fact, I revised my answer again to that <laughs> one. Uh, there's a part of of the of the fickle companion level where you have to drop down, kill a guy. Mm-hmm. Like move the platform, move the platform, so that it comes back, and as the key goes up, yeah, and then you have to race him over to the ladder mm-hmm. to climb up, and then wait till he's past the ladder, and then kill him because if you go back, then the time rewinds, yeah. and then the key doesn't attach to you. Uh, that one is my least favorite because the visual information of where the key is felt like it was a bug. And uh, yeah. and it just it made it impossible because it does it doesn't go smoothly it like jitters and jumps back yeah, to where it it's supposed to be. Follows your exact like movements. Well, sometimes I just saw it vanish and sometimes appear somewhere it just else. Drops to the ground. Yeah, and so I was really confused by a lot of the movement on that. So yeah, yeah. that is my <laughs> favorite, my least favorite puzzle in the game. Yeah, it's harder to pick a favorite. Like I feel like I remember specific moments. Like, it's not a particularly interesting puzzle, but the one, like, I called out earlier about having, like, the the pit with the green platform mm-hmm. and, have, like, just figuring that out was, like, an early game. Like, oh, of course. Ha-ha. <laughs> I've got it. I'm smart. You know, so it's more like those kinds of moments, I think, are the highlights. Yeah. Yeah, I think, I think it does a better job of creating memorable failures yeah than it does actually like making a puzzle that stands out in its entirety yeah there's the one where you have it's like a moving back and forth one where on like the left side it's got like the donkey kong and it's like the cannon that like shoots oh the, yeah yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. it's the one where you have to like do the first backwards jump to the other side that level felt super good to solve to me it, the backwards jump is a little bit bullshit, but like <laughs> that one felt like doable and satisfying, I think. Yeah. I think I it's it's there's the hunt level yeah. uh, with the forward and backwards movement where you have to like just figure out the order that they're going to be in and jump to. That one is like 
the uninteresting version of the Donkey Kong level. Yeah. Because that one's that, called Jumpman. Jumpman. Is what it's called. Yeah. That one is, is much more, I think, a much more creative use of the of the mechanic. So yeah. I think it is also creative to bring the exact same level back to show how mm-hmm. it works differently in each world. So I'm not going to, like, completely dismiss the hunt levels. But, yeah, that I think it is. it was done better in a previous level. Mm-hmm. And it made me less excited to do it again uh so i wanted to talk about world one a little bit sure um i i think it's really interesting that it's i wouldn't say it's like a victory lap but like it's not challenging it it just it sets up for the twist where everything in world one just moves backwards yeah uh so i thought that was really cool uh it it, it it somehow manages to feel ominous almost or like something's wrong and then it is. <laughs> uh, so I, I think that's interesting that it accomplishes that just with gameplay mechanics. Yeah. I think this game has interesting themes and an interesting method of storytelling, mm-hmm. but I don't think that the game sets a tone or a mood particularly well. I think that it, it ends up feeling very separate between it's like what it is presenting to you versus your experience of bashing your head against these puzzles. Mm -hmm. Uh, And I think world one gets to be the moment where those finally come together. Mm -hmm. Uh, And by all of that, what I mean to say is, yeah. (laughs) Yeah. It's just a really cool moment when you realize your rewind now makes things go forward. Right. Yeah. Uh, it's an interesting, like, subversion of, like, how the game has worked. Yeah, and you describe it as a victory lap, but it's, it's like, the first stage ends up being the second hardest, aside from the one that goes on and on and on, that's mm-hmm. called Braid. Uh, but the, the first stage, you have to, like, figure out what the fuck is yeah, even happening. Yeah, you have to figure out what's happening, yeah. Yeah. And so that ends up being pretty cool. So I, I, I agree with you. I think... World One might even be sort of in a weird backward kind of way, my favorite level because of that. Like, yeah, I mean, I think it, the ending is like the best part of the game. Yeah. Uh, so I guess we'll just talk about it now. Um, so the game has, you know, obviously set up this mystery, like what's World One gonna be? It's up in the mysterious attic. Uh, <sighs> keep talking about the princess and the further you get into the game, the more it seems like there's something up with that. Yeah. Uh, and you finally get there and as it manages to feel kind of ominous. And so you, you start the level and it's presented in such a way that it seems like the princess is being kidnapped and you're trying to get to her. Like you're both trying to race to get to each other so that you can help her. Uh, but you reach the end and you get to her window. Right. And then you play it all backwards and realize the reality because now in World 1, every th- the rewind makes things go forward. Right. Uh, you're actually like a creepy stalker man that's <laughs> chasing her and she's trying to get away from you and the night's saving her. And it's just like, it's such a cool moment. Uh, yeah. Like, um,. Yeah, I don't know. I just have, like, a lot of, like, respect for it. Like, it's hard to, like, sum it up how cool it is that, like, it manages to be a level that plays out one way forward and a different way back. Like, the... It seems, like, deceptively, like, simple. It was probably really hard to to make. Right. So that it, like, actually came across in red as, like, what was actually happening uh, without giving it away too early. Yeah, I, I agree. And it's it's... I think the reason that it works so well is because the the actual level is not easy to yeah. complete. Like it isn't so you don't think about it. Exactly. You're thinking more about your execution. This is the part where the game being a platformer starts to make more sense where it is like this level forces you to think about the platforming in a way that makes you not think about... Yeah, you've got time pressure. Yeah, or... the theme of what's going on. And so when you do get to the end, and then you start reversing, it all sort of comes together, which means that it was able to do a twist 
while showing you the end of the twist without you noticing. Mm-hmm. And it's able to to braid it nicely yeah. together. Yeah. I also for a second wondered if the braid in question was going to be somehow a Rapunzel reference. Uh, I, that makes enough sense. Yeah. But it does, I mean, I guess it kind of does that, because there is, like, the whole fairy tale theme to it. Mm -hmm. Uh, So I guess you could think of it that way, but not literally, (laughs) which is probably a good thing. Um, Yeah, and then you you get all the way back, and you leave into the epilogue, and then it spits you back out to the beginning of the game. Uh, So, like, it can be, like, read as, like, a cyclical thing that, like, if world one happens, you know, yeah. you you try to break into the princess's room <laughs> and uh, she runs away from you. And then like the rest of the game is kind of like him coming to terms with it mm-hmm. um, in like kind of like an endless cycle. It could be read as like a purgatory kind of thing or like a punishment or, you know, et cetera. Yeah. Or the way that I kind of take it is like, the the entirety of of world one is uh well i mean the whole game i guess is is something that takes place as a recollection of tim yeah and the other levels where it's talking about reversing time and doing things over again so like things he wishes he could do yeah are finally put in context because he essentially had this idea like the ideal like the princess Mm -hmm. that he fucked up and now wants to redo and come back and say like where did i go wrong yeah uh but i'm also as i may have mentioned earlier on this half (laughs) unsure if i understand whether that is like he wants to continue to pursue the princess and fix the things that he did or if he wants to go back and and fix his overall behavior and personality Mm -hmm. or the opposite where he is just broken and wants to go back because he is, he thinks he is right it, and yeah. has to, yeah, to to be the one who who wins in the end. No, I mean I think that all sounds like valid interpretation. Yeah, but man, am I not able to settle <laughs> on anything? I don't think you're supposed to be able to. Um, so this game has two boss fights. It does have two <laughs> weird boss fights. Yeah. Also, another thing that feels strange uh, in the, like, why does it have Mario stuff <laughs> uh, kind of way. Like, this, at least the second time, there's, like, a puzzle piece you can get after. Yeah. Um, and it uses, like, the shadow mechanic. It feels a little bit more like a thing. The first time feels kind of pointless to me. I'd agree, though you're talking to the guy who's like, "How do games need boss fights? <laughs> like, yeah. on multiple occasions in instances where the answer is very obviously yes. Mm-hmm. Uh, in this case, I think I've got a, a leg to stand on. I think they... This game has boss fights in the way that, like... Uh, I don't know, like a puzzle game would have a boss fight where... It feels like just sort of some cobbled together stuff. I think I agree with you by and large that the second iteration is better. And the first iteration feels like, what can we do with the assets that we already have? Can I shoot fireballs out of his mouth? (laughs) That's something that we can manage. And then you (laughs) hit the chandeliers down. It feels dumb and is not hard and is kind of weird. Yeah, it feels non-committal. Yeah. It's like, uh, I guess we'll put this in here. Uh, do you have other notes? Uh, you <laughs> notice how his name is Tim, which is time, time. with the E removed? Uh-huh. I... Uh, that was the only other note. <laughs> <laughs> I think. Well, then, do we have... Uh, how about Fractal? I don't get it. I just know Jonathan Blow talks about fractals. He's like, you can pick any point in the fractal and it's infinitely deep. Blah, 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 game design. Just pick a a concept and you can mine a deep whatever out of it for gameplay ideas and shit. Do we have fractal thoughts? (laughs) 
Uh, my fractal thoughts. Uh, this one's kind of tough, as we were discussing. Um, it's a game that it feels like you need to digest, mm-hmm. uh, which we haven't really had the time to do. Uh, but I, I feel like it's a game that I respect tremendously um, more than I actually like it. I I do like it, um, but it's a game that, like, I wish I liked more, I guess. Like, I wish I was a bit smarter. I know uh, you mentioned The Witness earlier is a game that I think looks really interesting, but I feel like it's something that I would bounce off of for sure. Um, And this is more accessible to me. Like, a puzzle platformer is more uh, my kind of thing. But... um, yeah, like it's it's a kind of like problem-solving puzzle game that requires like a big investment uh that can be pretty hard and lead to a lot of like downtime or tedium uh that you know just isn't really for everybody. Um but like it's got so many clever ideas. It's got, you know, like I really respect the puzzle design a lot. Um Every mechanic feels like it gets fully explored. Um, and yeah, like all the, the, there's like, it's, there's so much stuff to keep peeling back uh, with all the themes. It's like a game you could spend a lot of time thinking about. And I think like the, the ending, the, the, the titular braid level is a really like a great achievement. I think it's a really cool moment in uh, something I'll remember uh, for a long time. So a lot of great stuff in there. Um, it's just a very, like in a very niche package that can make it kind of difficult to appreciate fully. Yeah. Um, I feel I would say marginally similar to that. I also sort of had to spend a lot of my final thoughts energy, uh, in earlier parts of the, the podcast, uh, my biggest takeaway of this is I really like this game on a thematic narrative standpoint. Uh, not because I necessarily really like the themes of the narrative, but because they are a thing that made me think a lot about what was being implied. Um, it's just something I like when a game does. I like the idea of something that makes you have to work for it. And I'm sad that I wasn't really able to piece it together in time for the episode. Uh, As far as the game itself, I didn't really have very much fun playing it. Uh, I knew that going in, though. My expectations were set pretty much perfectly on this one, where I knew that the idea of this game was not something that I was going to engage with. It just isn't my style of thing. Um, And so I was able to go in with uh, the meek understanding that I was going to struggle a lot in the mechanics uh, and that I was just supposed to experience it for the cultural moment that it was. Uh, and I'm really glad that I did. I think that I'm I'm interested in having the Braid conversation with other people, being like, what did you take away from Braid? Especially if you played it multiple times. Uh and, like, what are the cool things? Because it has so many things in this game that I, I think are really cool on paper. Um, I, this is just a problem that I have where sometimes someone will do something that I personally hate. But when they talk about it, I did this thing. I'd be like, that's so different and cool. I'm glad that somebody did that and made other people suffer through it. Uh, and there are things like that in this game. Uh that I find really amusing and, and just uh, good ideas that are just implemented into a thing that I don't engage with super well. So, like, do I recommend Braid? Probably, yeah. It's it's a game that it would be weird for me to say no to that question. But, like, did I personally enjoy Braid? Uh, only on a weird subsurface exploration level the game itself didn't do a lot for me so uh there you go thank you for listening to no clip this week Mm, what did the die say this week (laughs) i I was like how are we gonna what's he gonna say because last time it was the first time Uh uh-huh the die the die the die will tell
the past, the present, and the future as well. All right, is the table produced? The table is up! All right, time to roll. Uh, we're doing Mystery May, by the way. We're going to roll on a table. <laughs> okay, hold on. To determine the game. Uh, this is the first Mystery May uh, full episode on Braid. That was a three that we rolled. Uh, and now we're rolling again to decide the second game that we're going to be doing for Mystery May. All right. N- no whammies. Ten. Ten. Man, I hate how <laughs> much you're going to like this result. Okay. Uh, next time, we're going to be talking about Child of Light. Oh, hell yeah. The, uh, yeah. This, uh, Ub- it's wow. a Ubisoft. Two games with a painterly aesthetic that JJ likes a lot. Yep. And our platforms? It was Child of Light and RPG. Child of Light is an RPG by way of like a metroidvania kind of world design right okay i have like a vague idea of what this is yeah i have no idea what you're gonna think of it hell yeah that's <laughs> exciting i think i own it on switch i think you I have it remember. on steam oh i don't steam maybe both who, anyway who knows we have multiple of light games on the thing because there's also town of light i mm. think is on the list uh regardless that's at least an interesting, cool result. So yes. I'm glad that we ended up with it. Until that time, you can get a hold of us. All of our contact information is on our website at noclippodcast.com or on splattershot.pro. You can peep the Mystery May table that we're rolling on at noclippodcast.com slash mystery dash May. Probably should have given it a lightly different <laughs> URL, but whatever. Uh, the link should be in the description now of this video and none of the other ones who cares uh there you can find uh links to our twitter account our email address the discord server you can suggest games for us to play uh and our youtube channel where there and on the website you can find all of our old episodes including episodes that we did on other puzzle game baba is you we had to have done puzzle platformers uh, we did The Last Guardian. I mentioned that earlier. That's so true. So why not say that? Yeah, Last Guardian. That's a puzzle platformer. In 3D. We talked about Super Mario 3D World, which is a platformer. <laughs> I know we've done puzzle platformers. <laughs> oh, we talked about Fantastic Puzzle Platformer and All Around Fucked Up Disaster Tamashi. Uh, one year. Trine. And we did try. Oof. We did do Trine. And I said the phrase, uh, Andy the Panty Dropper <laughs> Kinnick on it. So, always something to keep an eye out for. <laughs> uh, miss the jump and then rewind and readjust. So, smash that like button. Slow down. Slow down, Andy. <laughs> Don't try end the episode just right there. <laughs> all right, I'll take off my wedding ring. There, and yeah, use it right, to slow right. down. Perfect. Goodbye. Who was the guy? Bur- Bergenworth? No, Bergenon. Who was the guy who hosted America's Funniest Home Videos? Oh, oh, there's been multiple people. Well, the one after Bob Saget. I just, I always but before just, those two. I people. remember Daisy Fuentes and John Fugel saying, "Right." <laughs> <laughs> well, that's who we are. <laughs> welcome to No Clip. I'm Daisy Fuentes, and I'm John Fugel saying, <laughs> and welcome to America's Funniest Home Video Games. <laughs>